say that you want to like retake or oh hey what's up okay, <laughs> yeah wanna... there I, I couldn't get the video right so anything that you want to redo something that you don't like that you said um i can edit it out later okay sweet yeah so just let me know at any point and i'll take out whatever you want me to take out all right cool um so i'm just going to jump into it i'm going to introduce you and whatnot and then we're going to start just having a conversation okay all right sounds good man so um, we are going to be talking with Reed Chancellor now, who's of the Scandal Mongers, One Step, Jugs, and just a lot. Uh, <laughs> how are you doing, Reed? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I am really psyched to be talking to you right now. For real. Good, man. Likewise. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to jump right into uh, the Scandal Mongers. Um, who was the main songwriter for you guys? Uh. I guess it was me. I mean, we sort of, it sort of like switched as time went on. So like in the beginning, it was mostly myself and then Dylan, who was our drummer. And we mm -hmm. would kind of just write somewhat together. I'd write something on my own and then we'd bring it together. Um, and then as more people kind of came in, uh, I mean, the last album we did had, I would say it was probably like 70, 30 me 70 and then like logan wrote probably like 30 percent of it and we both started writing together more so on that album um but i guess that was probably i guess i would say i was probably primary uh but i mean it all kind of switched as time went on that's awesome i uh child songs i legit listen to child songs just as much as i do like no fx or somebody else like that. <laughs> well i'm i mean i'm i'm honored also, I mean, I, I don't know, that album is such a weird album, and it's, I mean, at this point, it's it's almost 10 years old, which is kind of crazy to think about, uh, yeah. but, I mean, you know, that's, you know, first album, doing a lot of stuff, that one was really, like, that was sort of before even, like, Logan was, like, a real member, so to mm -hmm. speak, he, like, I kind of just came in after we had already written the entire record, and I really, I don't even think Chase who was playing bass at that time, most of the album was probably recorded by just me and Dylan. Like, okay. So, it, and it was just kind of like, kind of almost haphazardly thrown together. Chase, I think was still in school and we recorded it in Nashville. So it was kind of a lot of traveling, but anyway, yeah, that, that was, so it's a weird album <laughs> looking back on it, at least like personally for me. Well, I, I love it. Like it's so, to me, it sounds so much like just the whole, warp tour culture that everything was <laughs> at that time and i love it it's just great well i'm 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 glad that you feel that way <laughs> that, that, that that's cool that means a lot um do you, what was your specific like or were there any specific inspirations for that or can you put your finger on it like for that album specifically or just like in general that that whole band well like the whole band in general uh sure i mean similar to like how we wrote songs it all it sort of changed as time went on and I, I feel like the albums do show somewhat of a progression from like child songs kind of has its own sort of sound and like writing style and then uglies kind of shifts into a different one and then endangered hits like really uh i feel like more so like the stride of the music i really wanted to be making at that time um <clears throat> like I mean, what first started, like, making me want to write songs in general was uh, a band called Calibretto 13, um, or then later was just Calibretto, and then same songwriter, Joe Whiteford, who also started Hartley Poe. So it's, like, all those, like, three bands. That really made me want to start writing songs. Um, so that's probably, like, the biggest influence just for starting a band, and then, you know, you get deep into the punk scene, or, like... For me, it was like Clash, and then when I, me and Logan started becoming better friends, he kind of introduced me into hardcore, and then that's kind of why I feel like Endangered really kind of hit at the time that I was playing in those other bands. Like that's when Endangered was the first album that we've made while I was also playing in One Step and in Jugs, and was like kind of opening up, I guess, different sort of avenues and different music and different influences. Okay, uh, give me just one second. My phone just dropped from 90% down to 20. Oh, shit. <laughs> so I, I need to put this on the charger before I lose you. Yeah, no problem. Because it might go down to one next. We don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, back into it. All right, cool. But no, there's um, there's a definite sense of maturity that you can tell to listening to it uh, as you progress. Like when you were, um, you, you can tell that some of it's you know more about like thoughts that you have whenever you're 18, 19 years old, and then some that are thoughts that you have whenever you're in your twenties and mid twenties. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's like looking back on it, and like every once in a while when me and you know anybody that was in the band you know when we talk it's just sort of like we look back on that and it's like yeah you know that's that's pretty well each of those albums makes a lot of sense for the time that we made them like <clears throat> i mean like you said child songs definitely sounds like an i feel like encompasses an album and encompasses the feelings that you have when you're like 18 and 19 and then in danger definitely feels like what you're encountering in your early 20s um which i think i mean I like that. I'm glad that it showcases that. Um, and I mean, it, and it's also, it's it, it's different for myself to look back on that because as the primary songwriter and most of the lyrics and like most of the songs, it's like, that was me when I yeah. was like 22. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I didn't really love who I was when I was 22 <laughs> or like, I don't you know, think I, anybody does. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, not too many people look back <clears throat> and when I was, when I was 18, I was a great person. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was awesome when I was 18. It's like, if anybody says that, then I, I immediately assume they are lying and probably Definitely. not a good person now. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> but, um, uh, no, whenever you're writing uh, music like that, anytime you write anything introspective or that makes you a little bit vulnerable, I know how, like, coming from an artist to an artist, I know how weird it can feel whenever you write something that's like, Oh, these are thoughts that I had in a really, really low moment. I'm just going to share them to everybody. Just fucking yeah. everybody's going to hear them. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. It's just crazy. It's a crazy feeling. Oh, yeah. Um, I thought that you were like, Scandalmongers was like a larger than life band in the scene. And I don't know if you know this, but you had a large amount of people who did that thought you guys were too cool to talk to and shit like that. <laughs> I would have um, never thought that. Not in a million years. I never. Uh, we never I never got that that vibe or that feeling. So that you guys that's really obviously cool to hear. <laughs> obviously you guys are some of the nicest coolest dudes who were in the scene at that time and just are still around now. Um but there some of those rumors went so far that I heard from more than one source that you guys were sponsored by Orange. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> Not at all. No. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where I don't think we I don't think we ever had any sponsorship whatsoever. I don't think there was ever one. Uh I mean I played an orange cabinet for a little bit. I didn't even have an orange amp. Um, I think that may have been what it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just there's an orange cabinet on stage sometimes, a little orange two twelve, <laughs> like just, and I I think it was Dylan's. Honestly, is Dylan <laughs> Dylan who had it? He probably had it from when he was in Stereo Shoutout because they probably did have an orange <laughs> sponsorship. So it's not even. That's great. <laughs> yeah, no no truth to that at all. <laughs> That's great. Um. One of the uh, first shelter shows that I ever remember going to, I went to whenever I was really little, but the ones that really resonated with, you know, I was actually part of the community, um, mm -hmm. was One Step was playing a show with Jugs and um, Small House and Thunder Dreamer, and Gary Martinez mm -hmm. was opening up, and um, Was he like doing like a, like a DJ set almost, like he was doing like electronic stuff? Well, that actually, that one with Gary, this, this was my first introduction to noise music at all. Okay, and yeah, it threw me off. I come in and Gary Martinez, who I love Gary to death. Oh yeah, same. I, everybody loves Gary to death. He's a oh, great yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I hope he hears this and gets a laugh. But uh, the first <laughs> time that I, I, I just walk into the shelter and he's standing there with a table and it has um, guitar pedals all over it and a guitar laying down on it, a fan on the edge of the table. And just a bunch of drums and like a couple drumsticks. And he grabs a microphone. And he goes, "Hi, I'm Gary." And then turns everything on and just starts beating the shit out of the guitar. And I was like, "Whoa, what yeah. is, this is it, man. <laughs> this is it." Yeah. No, I do remember that show. Um, yeah, man, Gary Top shut it down. Falter was there too. That's it. Okay, yeah, that was the Falter show because we've had. Falter, I think, played twice at, like, those Mesker Shelter House shows, and both times cops did shut it down. Um, I think that – I don't know if that one was the one. Logan used to book all of those. Any mm -hmm. Like, Falter was his connection. Like, he knew those guys. Um, 
So anytime they played, and I do think that was the one that One Step and Jugs both played, which was a terrible time for me. <laughs> it was way too much work. Uh, <laughs> and like, you know, I mean, Jugs is is ridiculous um, in every sense of the word, but mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we blast through 13 songs in 12 minutes <laughs> and then One Step plays like two bands later and shelter house, no air conditioning, just like just drenched in sweat and Oh man. I mean those were those were really fun shows, but they were also very tiring <laughs> and it just like such a it's such an odd time really when I think about it. And and Evansville scene is sort of like that too, because you know, we can sit here and talk and that was probably what, like almost like six six or seven years ago, probably, when that show happened. Um probably would have at been least like, seven. At least yeah, seven. It would have been like twenty thirteen. So it's As like a junior. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, so it would have been, man. You <laughs> and I always, I always joke that like Evansville's music scene comes out in like five year bursts, where it's like we have five years of building a scene, and then it just, just it's gone, and then yep. we have five more years of building it up, and so you have like four years of building and like shit, <laughs> and then you have one year <laughs> of like awesome excitement. And then it immediately goes away, and then you have a whole nother cycle. Because um, you know, when I talk to people about when they started going to shows in early 2000s and 90s in Evansville, when you had uh, the Rev or the Coffee House, and then that turned into Wired, and then into with 1123 and Grinders, and we had all of that. Like. You know, five years later, you're always looking back like, oh, those were the good days. Like, you know, when people were going to Boney June's, everyone's like, man, this sucks. I hate it. I hate <laughs> the thing. And then five years later, everyone's like, remember when Boney June's was awesome? <laughs> like, we always have that. It just, it's a cycle that just continuously goes. So when I look back at those Shelter House shows, like in that moment, I was like, man, this is, this is a lot. <laughs> and then now I'm like, oh, man, that was pretty cool. Sometimes I think that that would be fun to to look back on or like do that something like that again, and then I remember that I'm almost thirty and I don't think I could handle it. <laughs> you know that specific shelter house show um, was the reason that I started booking shows. Um, I don't remember what my thinking about the whole show was. I, it was Logan. It was Logan's fault because he like yeah. came up and he shook my hand and he was like, he was like, "Hey, I'm throwing the show," and I was like. I go to fucking high school with him. Like, what do you mean he's throwing the show? <laughs> so then I was like, I can do this too. And yeah, that's where it started. It, man, it's funny. And I always forget that we went to high school together because you guys were, yeah. you were a freshman when I was a senior. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I, I like, I always forget that, but I always remember you had a Mohawk freshman year, didn't you? Oh, huge Mohawk. Okay. <laughs> I thought so. And that, that's all we knew you as you were like, we were like, yeah, these are, this is the guy with the mohawk who sometimes shows up at the hatch and moshes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, no matter what it is, like, someone could be doing a Linkin Park cover and you're up there. Moshing. Throwing and, down, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's, like, because Logan always remembered that. And he was like, yeah, we got to have, like, he always wanted to tell, like, anytime we were playing a show, if it's, like, 15 people and if you and, like, your crew, or, like, the Sausage Slam crew was all there. It was like, well, at least people are going to mosh, and at least people are going to, like, <laughs> having fun, because that's, that's what matters, and that's, like, yeah, that support um, that sometimes I, I, I think there was less of it than I thought, like, than I wanted, but then also you look back, and it's like, I mean, no, that's, that we had the support. You had the support from the people who actually cared, and so you had that, mm-hmm. you know, it, it is that, that true thing, because now I look back and I'm like, man, those were the good days. And in that time, I was like, this sucks. <laughs> so, yeah. Just... I, oh, um, I always sit and watch, like, old sets from shows at, like, PG, Boney Junes, uh, Shelter Shows. And I'll be like, I remember being at some of the shows, or I'll, I'll pick myself out in the audience and think, like, man, while I was there, I was like, who's playing next? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now I'm watching it and I'm like, man, that was so much fucking fun. Why wasn't I more into that? Yeah, absolutely. That that's that, I think that's definitely in the Midwest. I feel like that's like a very common thing. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I know we may we may talk we can talk more at length about this later. But like when I first pitched to the books that I'm doing now, 
and like writing and drawing the first book I pitched or was offered was like a, a scene history of all of Evansville and so it was going to be like starting in probably like 88 through like any of the time probably like 2015 when Scandalmongers quit that was going to be my Damn. scene history and that was the idea of it but I remember the publisher is in Portland and when I tried to like go through and explain like the five-year building and destroying thing they he didn't get it he was kind of like that doesn't he's like that doesn't make sense <laughs> like and i think just like and i remember talking to someone about it and he's like where is he from he's like west coast and he's like yeah they probably don't have that like yeah like west coast or even like the scenes in like new york that's just it's constantly going and reinventing itself and like people used to say when i lived in nashville it was like same thing you you work in nashville until you the only way to make it is to not work in nashville is to exclusively like be set in nashville get noticed and then not play nashville anymore <laughs> and so it's kind of like everything's so counterintuitive and it's just an odd world and sort of an odd like experience as a whole yeah um it's definitely different from like here to i bet I don't know if I can, um, New York definitely has a crazy different scene than anywhere in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And oh. LA is crazy different than anywhere mm -hmm. in New York. But, um, one other thing that I was going to talk about, you, were, you already um, touched on a lot of the venues, but Boney June specifically was a whole different face of the scene. And like, I mean, every time that I went to a show at Boney June's local or touring band or anything, it it doesn't compare to anything that I see now or anything that you would see yeah. before. <laughs> it was like such an anomaly, like a, like a, a twilight zone point in our music scene. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the bony June, it's, it's like such a specific era of like what was popular and like, and it's just kind of, kind of came back a bit that, we talk about that era of the scene more. Like if you read articles and things, people are like, oh yeah, you can talk about attack attack now. <laughs> like, we're, yeah, we can, like, bring, we can bring that back. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, I loved attack attack. I listened to so much attack attack. I had both CDs, like actual CDs of it. And, and that just like bony dunes completely encompasses that. <laughs> and so like, when I think about it, it is, it's just like, it doesn't really there's no cross section with any other part of the scene other than that specific brand of like mid to late 2000s cotton candy like merch style yeah. neon, neon skinny jeans um <laughs> swoopy hair eyeliner just that whole thing and it's so crazy now to think back me and my wife not long ago we were watching, you know, we watch a lot of YouTube and she follows a lot of YouTube YouTubers and we were just watching and it's like, you know, Jeffree Star came up and I'm like, dude, I remember seeing <laughs> Jeffree Star at Boney June's watching Stereo Shout Out play their first show opening for him and just being like, man, like that's, it's just insane. And now, I mean, he's a millionaire and he's like running right. a makeup company and you're just like, I saw you play to, to, 50 weird like probably hopped up kids on pills <laughs> like, like that that was that was the scene i have that conversation with my fiance all the time because she loves jeffrey stars like makeup and shit and i'm like oh yeah you know whenever i saw jeffrey star he was like kind of bringing some dude who everybody thought was a pedophile on tour with him <laughs> like he was a weird yep. dude yeah there was that i remember he was like probably anorexic like he yeah. was like rail thin and it i mean you just didn't we didn't know like <laughs> i had no idea who he was until i went to that show and i remember being terrified um, <laughs> just the, the whole and it was like the whole thing of that and especially like myself i like grew up in a religious household and like things like that and so when i started going to shows you sort of <laughs> like it opens the door to just people that you've not seen before and like types of people you haven't seen and it kind of it it always it almost kind of like not it does not justify it this way of thinking but it's one of those things to where when you go to a show like that it 
it, like when I look back, I think, you know, there's a reason why my mom thought that it was a horrible <laughs> thing for me to go to. <laughs> yeah. like, there's a reason like when my parents drop me off at like a show and they take one look at the people, they're like, you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, know, you know, it makes sense. I look back and I'm like, yeah, I could get that if I took my kid to, you know, to go see Harley Poe play in a, a hair salon by Bossy Field. <laughs> and I took one look, and the first thing I see is a guy with a with a giant swastika tattooed on his arm with an X through it. I'm gonna think, do I want my kid to go here? <laughs> like I, I get it, but also, I mean, that I think that's just part of the fun of it. Is just that entire mm -hmm. like, it's just it's a whole it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different experience, and you know, people. I think people who who had that those experiences get it. People who didn't have it just they just don't get it. And it, it's just, I think it, it's like a, <laughs> like, I, I always kind of attribute, it's not the same as far as, like, the magnitude of it and, of course, like, the amount of it. But when you meet somebody who is part of the scene, even if you didn't, like, know them at all, you immediately have that, like, okay, we think the same. We Definitely. Still have that thing, same thing. I always, like, attribute it to, like, similar to, like, veterans somewhat like not to that extent of course not to the level of like dedication and things like that but that like you know whether like because like same with like me and you we have we're both involved in the scene but sort of from like that five-year difference to where mm -hmm. like when I quit you know the scene was still in the process of being built on that second tier of the five years um and so it's like we can look back and it's like they may be different or like you went to we went to different shows but we both understand those same exact feelings and the same exact like experiences definitely I, I love that about it and um, the, the Evansville music scene um, a, a lot of people that I've talked to they say it's very gatekeepy and I can understand why they think that um, however for the most part even the people who are gatekeepy will it for me or you or a lot of people who you know are obviously decent people who have good intentions they'll be welcomed at almost any situation if somebody from the scene is there and i think that's great i think that's great yeah and i mean to to that effect a little bit just like the gatekeepiness i, I think that that's very true but we got to also look at like the time period specifically i think mm -hmm. you know time period of like growing up in the scene and like really scandalmongers didn't start playing shows until maybe 2008 we played our first show and like playing in 08 it was like a different really different time because there wasn't any like really there wasn't much like bashing but there was a little bit of that like that same year I think was the year that 1123 had the battle of the bands that ended in like an actual fist fight <laughs> and like the cops showing up and and there was kind of like that drama. You also had all of like the Tyson stuff, the Tyson Singer stuff, which I don't really even know the full story, but anybody from Evansville has probably a Tyson story or two. And that's just like, we had all of that going on. And so the drama just sort of builds up and it's like any scene. Um, but, you know, I've always said that it's like, no matter what you're doing, whether it's music, whether it's art, comics or whatever, like, what makes a good scene is, like, when your favorite bands or favorite creators are also, like, your friends. Like, your peers Definitely. are that. So it's, like, when I look back and I can say that my two favorite bands uh, are two of my favorite bands of all time are Mock Orange and Calibretto slash Harley Poe. And I can say I know both of those those main people, like... I can call them buddy. I can email them. I can call them if I needed to. Like, the fact that that exists makes my experience in the scene and, like, my understanding of it, like, great. Definitely. Um, nope, too. If, if, if I were going to put... I, I have done several times throughout being a teenager in the music scene, made, like, a list of my favorite local bands and posted it on every form of social media. But um, always a main fixture of, like, the top five is um, the Scandalmongers, Cool Mutants, and One Step are always all three in there. <laughs> and um, One Step was an, uh, another thing that I want to touch on a little bit. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that it was like a lot of just like sweat and just uh, 
pretty much sweat. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of I that. I feel like drumming for one step would be a very sweaty job. Yeah. But, uh, no, you guys, I really enjoyed the music that you put out. Um, who was the main songwriter for that? Was it Kurt or Logan or? One Step was, <laughs> uh, One Step is such a weird thing just as a whole. Because, so One Step started and, um, I wasn't in One Step when they started. Um, I was asked to record One Step. And so I recorded One Step, and then they didn't like my recordings, which was fine. <laughs> I, and, you know, really, when I think about it, they weren't that good. But then they, you know, kicked out their drummer, and they recorded it on their own. And for that first EP, which I think uh, was just the self-titled EP, um, Caleb, who played guitar in One Step, also played drums on that EP. Uh, so the first one is Caleb on drums, Caleb on guitar, Logan bass, Kurt vocals. And <clears throat> stepping into it, it was mostly like Caleb would write a riff, Logan, or Caleb would write a riff, Kurt would write the lyrics, and then Logan would write the the roadmap. So it was very much like all of us together could kind of figure something out because it's like Caleb would come in with like, I have this riff. Okay, cool. Let's go into a second part. And one step was very formulaic, hardcore. It's like, well, you start yeah. fast, there's one slow part, and then the song's over. <laughs> like, just be done, <laughs> you know? Uh, I think the longest one-step song was probably, like, a minute and 20 seconds still. Like, that's, that's, that's long, that's, like, almost shorter than most Jug songs, which is <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I mean, I didn't write, I never wrote anything in, um, in one step, and I think that's probably why I liked it. <laughs> liked yeah. it step was because i didn't have that it was just like all right i'm gonna show up i'm gonna play drums i'm gonna watch logan and caleb argue for too long about whether this riff sounds too much like this riff and and then then we're gonna record in like six months <laughs> or we're gonna play one show every once in a while uh i was joking we were like the laziest band in hardcore like we didn't want to do anything but yeah. like i still think that um you know, the State of Disrepair EP is probably one of the best things I was ever involved in, like playing and like one of the best sounding things. Um, and it doesn't sound it sounds so different than like the hardcore that was being made at that time, because mm -hmm. nobody like jockeying youth, a youth crew type hardcore or, you know, the fact that we did like a Youth of Today cover a lot. Like I remember going to so many shows and rarely ever seeing people like cover that you know they're gonna cover stuff because everybody does that mm -hmm. but like i'd never see someone cover a youth of today song or it's like trying to cover the bad brains it's just like you're probably not gonna do it right but oh yeah <laughs> it's just so so it's like an odd thing to be playing we didn't have slow parts there was no there was no side to side part of one step <laughs> it was just we're gonna play this fast there's gonna be one slow breakdown for like 20 seconds and then the song's gonna be over like that's just how one step operated. <laughs> uh, it was good, definitely. It was something to throw down to, like every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, another, so we talked about uh, Boney Junes a little bit. Mm -hmm. What about the Hatch? What do you have any like? I I wasn't around for the Hatch very much. I, there was a uh, whenever I was really young, I was involved, and then I didn't really come for a long time and then i started getting involved again right around the time of the hatch closing down gotcha but uh was there any golden years that i missed that i should know about i don't i mean really for the entire like life of the hatch when it was the hatch because that building has been mm -hmm. three venues i mean you know that was the coffee house and then it was the rev and then it was shut down and then when it came back as the hatch and heather and clint took it over like, I would say the entire time of the hatch was kind of like a golden, golden time, just in the sense that I saw so many things happen there that are kind of crazy to think about. Like, the idea that in this basement <clears throat> painted black, covered in <laughs> brick and tile, so horrible for sound, and like, Michael Graves played there. <laughs> Like, uh -huh. And weirder than that, Jugs opened for Michael Craig <laughs> <laughs> and played a, a Misfits cover of the Danzig era because. Of <laughs> <people>. <laughs> but 
<laughs> I didn't know you guys did that. Open, open the set with asterisks. Oh, like, that is the most badass thing I've ever heard, man. I mean, it was serious, but also, I mean, I mean, I'm sure Michael Graves probably wasn't there. <laughs> he wasn't No, he yet. was drunk in the van or something. Yeah, he wasn't hanging out. He was too busy getting his Remington hat ready. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, gosh. But I remember that. I mean, you saw that. It's all trapped under ice. You know, you see Zabulba. You see um, Backtrack, Take Offense. Like, so many of those, like, really, like, bands that kind of encompass what hardcore is today. Like, yeah. went through there, and they played there. And then, you know, I can also say, like, I saw bands like Better Off there, which was really cool. Um I'm trying to think now. Of course, I'm like spacing on all of it, but it was just it was just a blast. Like being being a part of that. Like the Hatch was probably I would refer to as like my version of like golden years of music scene because it was they were the shows that you know I went to. If even if I didn't know who all was playing, it's like well yeah I'm gonna go to that show because I want to support the people who run it. I want to support those bands that are playing. You know seeing Wild Night, seeing Off the Record, um, seeing all the, seeing Quinn, seeing um, <clears throat> Be My Doppelganger, Cool Mutant, seeing all those bands there, like, that was, that was part of it. Um, and I don't think, I don't think the only other place that really kind of put that type of vibe was PG, because I do think PG had a lot of culture around the scene. PG oh, had yeah. its own scene. You could, if you played a show at PG, you knew, well, I'm going to have the stock PG crowd there, like, no matter what. You know, any night you would go there, you'd have at least roughly the same 15 to 20 people that would be at PG if there was a band playing or there wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was it was great. That was one of my... Uh, PG was where I ran into my golden years, uh, just because, you know, age, and that was literally the five years yeah, okay. <laughs> that you're referring to. Yeah. Um, but I got to, I got, we got to see a few bigger bands that were there at P, um, at PG, um, nowhere near like the size of the bands at the hatch, just because it's a much, much smaller space. Oh, yeah. yeah. But the, um, I, I wasn't around for the like huge shows at the hatch. Unfortunately, every show I went to at the hatch was scarcely populated. Um, but well, and there's, and it's, it's funny. I mean, I'm probably romanticizing it a little bit just because I feel like everybody does that romanticize the heck out of it dude <laughs> yeah no absolutely just that like because i remember yeah i can i can probably count three maybe three times ever i played at the hatch and there were more than like 100 people there or more than like 75 people and i'm probably exaggerating that even um yeah because they're just uh, i'm not counting cover shows because cover shows were always oh bad. yeah uh because that is honestly it's it's hilarious that like, that says everything about Evansville's scene, probably. That the only shows you could guarantee were packed and, like, everyone supporting and singing along and, like, moshing is the one show a year that nobody plays any original material. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, everyone's just covering songs, and that's the only time that, like, everyone is, like, super into it. Um, which I think is funny. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, those are probably, when I think back at the most fun show I ever played, it's it's the cover show, obviously. Yeah. It's yeah. like probably the three, the three cover shows that we did, yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, you you pretty much answered everything I was going to say about PG, or okay. <laughs> ask about PG before <laughs> that, so that's, I, I love that. Um, we're going to move straight on to Wired. Okay. And, um, whenever I through my first show, I, I, I just put a post on Facebook, like, hey, I need I, I help, and um, um, Jesse, I can't remember Jesse's last name right now, Folder. but you know exactly who I'm, Jesse Folder. Yeah, uh, Jesse Folder, yeah. But he, um, he hit me up, and I didn't know he owned Wired. Um, I knew about Wired whenever I was a little kid. First show I ever went to, as like five, six years old, was Mock Orange was the headliner, and mm -hmm. there was like Something really heavy at the very beginning, and my six-year-old brain couldn't quite handle what was going on. Sure, yeah, <laughs> but that's uh, like, it's probably like Wired on Main Street because I think I was. saw because I saw Mock Orange play at Wired on Main Street I think once. 
Um, oh, hopefully it was the same show. <laughs> it very well could have been, but I, I honestly, they played there, I think, quite a bit in the beginning, because um, that was really all we had was there in 1123. But anyway, continue. But um, I, Jesse, he shows up on this Facebook post. He's like, hey, my band Upsetter wants to play. I'll bring a PA system. I'll bring this. I'll bring that, blah, blah, blah. I got, I got your back, man. He hooked me up with everything I need, and then he was like, hey, I actually own Wired, so if you want to ever play a show over there, just come on over. So I felt like I, I was 18 just through my first show, and I felt like I made like a major connection, and yeah. I, I thought I was on top of the world. And then um, through that connection, I meet you mm -hmm. outside of school, outside of uh, the other ways that I've known you, yeah. and we become friends there, and you, mm -hmm. you go to recording... Uh, sausage slam and all that but just what, what was wor working at wired like tell me how what your role was there on a daily basis and you know just what was it like what was the best part sure yeah so like my time working at Wired, i didn't really work there all that long um and it was just sort of this like weird thing that kind of happened i remember um a lot of stuff had happened in my life and i had kind of like hit a reset button um and I went with Sean Little, who's a hip hop artist in Evansville. I went on a tour with him. We went overseas and we toured in Germany. Um, what? Yeah, he like yeah, he got he, he was hooked up with like this. Uh, I forget the name of the company, but it was a company that booked shows at overseas military bases, like American military bases <laughs> overseas. So we went and like played at a bunch of like. DOD schools for like American kids living in Germany, Italy, and Belgium. And so we spent like a month doing that. And that whole time, Sean was like, what are you doing with your life? What are you going to do with your life? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what's going to happen. And he mentioned something like, well, I know that like Wired's looking to open back up and like kind of go full force again. And I was like, oh, interesting. Maybe I'll send something to Jesse. Um, and I did. And we met up, and he was basically like, well, we need a person to do all this stuff. Would you be interested in doing this? And uh, I said yes. I probably should have <laughs> uh, thought more about it because there wasn't really – it was something that I was basically doing, like, with no pay. Like, there was no money mm -hmm. involved. So it's just like, you know, trying to help with the upkeep of the venue and uh, with the sound quality, trying to – build together something that could be used as a scene. And that building was like a perfect building to be used as almost like a, a co-op for like bands. Cause the building was definitely, huge. you had the basement, you had a venue, you had all these extra rooms, you had a radio station. It could have been a lot. Um, and that's what like kind of my plan was or what I wanted to eventually do. Um, it ended up not working out just due to the fact that like, <laughs> I needed to work. I needed money. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so I had to move to different jobs and then started working more jobs and was just staying way busier than I could. Um, but Wired is just such a – I owe, like, probably my whole interest in local music to Wired because those were the first shows I went to on Wired on Main Street, you know, seeing bands like Sabrosa and Slick Nicholas. And that just experience was – was everything and I was like that's what I want to do um to the point where eventually when it moves to fourth street after it closes on main street we during like the child songs era I guess like Scandalmonger somewhat became we always joked about it, we were like the house band because like any show they had we that wasn't like a heavy show we got asked to play um which and at that time I'm in that mode where I'm like yeah yes to every show like why would we? Yeah. Why, why not play a show? And it's like, oh, well, that's probably why we got really burned out <laughs> real fast. But um, I, I just, I loved Wired. I mean, that's where we played our last show. That's where, um, I mean, like some of my favorite shows were played there, which is which is odd to think about because really it didn't last that long. And I don't think that Wired. I mean, Wired's not a thing anymore and hasn't been for a long time. You know, Jesse. I think is living in Africa now. Mm -hmm. So like he's moved. Andy, I think has finally either sold the building or at least it's emptied out now. Like they did like a huge auction for like all of the stuff there. It's just, it's wild. Like that you just see that place just no longer exist. 
Uh, interestingly enough, whenever I learned that Wired was up for sale, like I don't know if this is a year ago, two years ago, or when it was, but uh, you can ask Andy about this. He'll back it up. I, I tried to buy Wired. <laughs> I tried really, really, really hard to buy Wired, but it did not work out. And oh, man. It sucked. Uh, and I've, I've I had have... my... Go ahead. Oh, no. I just... I always, like, wanted... If I if I had the money and, like, the drive and, like, let's just say I won the lottery and, like, could choose whatever I wanted to do, that space would be, like, a perfect space just to do anything. I've always... Exactly. Yeah. It's just... It's the dream. You know, you could, you could have everything from a venue, a little restaurant, a record store, a comic book store. You could do anything in that space. And that's always what... Deep down, that's what I always wanted. And just it could never, we, you just can't build it. It's just so hard. Um, I feel like now it'd be easier because Evansville's downtown is kind of turning into a little bit metropolis. of metropolis. Yeah, I mean, you're they're they're building all those new condos down there. You're, you know, people are actually kind of putting in the effort to make it like feel like an actual downtown and not just mm -hmm. a random main street surrounded by a bunch of weird buildings. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, it could probably work now, but at that time, you know, just people weren't, people weren't doing it. People didn't care. Yeah, it's, un, it's unfortunate. Um, but it, everything you just said, like the, the record store and whatnot, I made a pitch and I went to U.S. Bank and like I pretty much just with the same inflection you were, I was like, dude, I'm going to put like a record store in here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put like a restaurant. I'm going to make money. Promise. I promise. And but, they said, uh, you go in there with a mohawk. I did not. I was, dude, you wouldn't, I, I have suits, man. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I get professional sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, that, it, yeah, no, it didn't happen. Yeah. Wish it did, but didn't. That, that uh, what about City Church? I, I showed up there one day and you were drumming in the church band. I see you yeah. everywhere that the music is. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. What, what do you uh, do there other than that? Uh, so I'm, I'm actually, I, I am on staff there. Um, uh, my official title, I guess, is tech director and tech and worship arts director. Um, so, like, for a time, I just basically ran all of the sound and all the engineering side of it. And then, uh, you know, the worship leader or, like, the music leader and worship pastor has kind of – we've had different people come in and out. Uh, so, right now, myself and Emily Bernhardt um, – are like running it, which I think you know her husband probably Ty Ty Bernhardt. Oh yeah, I do yeah. know him. Yeah, he gave me donuts yeah. at City Church. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, and so me and her are kind of like running the music side of it there. Um, so yeah, I mean, and that's like, I really like I've always played music in church. That's been like sort of the way I was able to kind of con myself into playing music for a long time. Was like it's the first place I ever saw a drum set and. Like, being like, hey, mom and dad, I want a drum set. And they're like, no, that's loud. <laughs> like, we're not giving you that. Like, we're not going to drop $300 for you to play something loud for a year and then give up. It's like, oh, okay. But, you know, at the church, it's like every chance I can, play the drums, play on the drums, touch the drums, mess with them. And then it's like, well, I could play drums at church. If, I, if you got me a drum set, I could play drums for the Lord. <laughs> and then that can become this thing um and i think i feel like that really did have a big part of it um i've never talked to my parents about that directly probably should <laughs> see if that's actually if there's any truth to that or if they were just like no we just waited for you to ask for four years straight before we said yes um, <laughs> but so yeah i've always done that i always play like since middle school i played at church and um i led I led worship at a church in Mount Vernon for a few years. Uh, and what, then, what church? Uh, Black's Chapel. It's a Methodist okay. church there. Um, me and Dylan did that, actually. He played drums for it. And then when I left to work at City, Dylan actually took over and was the worship leader there. And then Dylan is now, like, the co-worship leader at Resurgence. And it's, like, it's, it's odd because um, – and I don't know, maybe you can shed some light on it. I've had so many people say that they like would often consider Scandalmongers to be a semi-Christian band, which is always funny to me, <laughs> just because. And I do think some of like the terminology that I used in there 
obviously there's some faith behind it just because, you know, I'm talking about whether it's 30 pieces of silver or, you know, my prayer for Hey Arnold getting, coming back, not getting answered. Like, that's just terminology. Stop talking about that. I get it. Um, but now it's funny because it's like, well, you know, half of the band, you know, is employed and like works partially for, for a church. And, you know, I never thought of it that way, especially in Endangered when there's, you know, and, and Uglies as well being the first songs that I was like, all right, I'm going to say cuss words now. I'm over it. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't care if my, if my mom hears this <laughs> anymore, I'm going to say shit and it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> So, but yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of, I feel like so much of Evansville's music scene really does center around the church as well. Cause a lot of our music venues were, were quote unquote Christian music venues. Um, and the, you know, the hatch was in the basement of a church, whether, which is great, whether or not, you know, and I, my favorite thing that the hatch did was it's like, it didn't matter if it was, Zabalba, which all of their merch says 666, you yeah. know, playing in the basement of the church, or if it was, you know, a tooth and nail band, if it was, you know, Run uh, Run Kid Run or Sidewalk Slam and those bands that were like proto tooth and nail starting up and like the whole beginning of the, the Christian punk scene. Um, and same with Wired, because Wired was like that. For a long time, Wired wouldn't even let you cuss on stage. And I remember, like, when I started working there, that was, like, the biggest thing that I had to, like, that I was like, we need to not, that doesn't matter. Like, give up on that. We got to let people say what they want to say as long as they're not being hateful. Um, and, you know, creating that. Because, like, the music scene is, like, its own form of the church, <laughs> I think. You know, we all yeah. have that same feeling. Um, when I talk to people who like have no background in church or in re organized religion at all, which I don't think is a bad thing if you don't have that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do kind of attribute to it. It's like, oh, well, it's like, it's like a music scene, but just with like centered around specifically different things. Um, Cause you still have that same idea. You know, you want to, you have events, you support people, you put things together. Although instead of, you know, running around in a circle and punching each other you're putting together potluck dinners <laughs> it's kind of how how it works which the hatch did a few times we did put together potluck dinners at the hatch which was a lot of fun and i'm glad i that, went to one <laughs> yeah the things i think they only did it like two or three times and i only went i think probably the second two but one year i made the turkey and i remember being really proud of myself for that and when i say i made the turkey i mean my mom helped me make a turkey but <laughs> she made the turkey and i'll like, do three things with it <laughs> so but no uh bringing up that potluck just uh sudden memory haven't thought about in years uh i was there there was like a little kiddie pool there for some some reason and nobody was in it it was there though like mm -hmm. right outside of the church and clint was like hey i need somebody to move that me and jason hopper were like well, we're helpful, nice guys. We're going to go move it. And then we go up to move it. And then everybody started making fun of us. And we wanted to leave. <laughs> everybody was like, oh, look at them. They think they're so cool moving the little kiddie pool around. And I was like, oh, shit, man. I'm like, sorry. That's. <laughs> I can imagine who I would maybe think would be the people who are saying that. And they probably did not mean it in any mean way. Oh, I know that now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just so funny that that was like. Oh, that that was just that scene, that group of people. Like I remember playing at the, I remember playing at the Hatch, and somebody I was with, like Jugs played, and someone I was with went up to Logan after the jet, the set, and was like, "That was really good. Like that was great." And he was like, mm. "Shut the fuck up! No, it wasn't. Like <laughs> so bad." <laughs> somebody complimented him, and he was so mean, and it was That's awesome. great. And that was just kind of how everybody was, you know, we all just, and when you, when you first kind of step foot into that scene, you don't really, you don't really know it because you don't know the people. And, and that's one thing, you know, whether they're your friends or they're not, <laughs> they're still going to say stuff like that to you. Um, oh yeah. You know, the different context of it, but <laughs> that's really funny. Right. They, they made fun of you for moving the kiddie pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, um, 
Fortunately, that event did not push me away from the scene or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was still part of it. Um, Hand tossed records. You, <laughs> yeah. you started that up, and then I, I I don't really know what all else happened. I know that I signed to it or signed to it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, air quotes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, and uh, no, just tell me what, how did you start it? Why did you start it? All that. Yeah, I mean, it existed and then it, it just stopped. And the big reason for that is I just, I ran out of time and I, or like ran out of, yeah, ran out of time in my life to do things. Um, I don't know. It was just like, I wanted something to release a lot of music that either I had made or, and like just that a few friends had made. Um, <clears throat> originally, it was going to be something that like me and Clark Osborne put together. That was like the idea because Clark was just starting to run his recording studio and it was like, well, we can do maybe like this thing together where if like I agree to like help these bands like put out a record, then like you can record it for like maybe a discount and then we can kind of like make this happen as like a collective. And that was the idea. And then it just never really came to fruition just because I was working probably four jobs at that time. And then I was still like, hey, I'm going to add another thing onto this. Um, which looking back, like I look at like the band camp is still there and I'm really proud of a lot of the music that's on there. And like, you know, recording Sausage Slam was a blast recording. Um, I'm trying, I don't think there's like a lot of like of my home recordings are on there. The live recording of the Scandalmongers last show is on there. My solo EP, a couple other stuff. It was just like. I just wanted like one place to put all the music on it. And my idea was to only make music that like release music that was made by hand, quote unquote, meaning the hand tossed. So like yeah. the records that like the actual records that were made, um, excuse me, like the seven inches were all lathe cut records, which meaning they were made in real time on an actual record lathe. Um, so like the one step um, we did state of disrepair, like maybe 20 of them on like clear plexiglass. And then that's what we did the sausage slam seven inch on. Um, And that was like the whole idea where like everything is just going to be made by hand. That's how we're going to do it. Um, And then just quickly like had to fall to the wayside just because of time. Um, But I mean, I don't know. It was, it was fun. I I still like the idea that that exists. I'm glad that band camp still exists because I can, if I decided tomorrow that, I wanted to record something and release it. I could do it because it could be out there and I wouldn't have to make a whole new band camp or anything. Um, but I don't know. That just, I guess that kind of just goes in like the pile of ideas that I had that I really wanted to do. And if I had nothing else going on, could have done. Like it's this, I, I view it the same as like, I didn't finish college. <laughs> like <laughs> I had to work full, I needed to work. And so I didn't finish college. And so it's like, I didn't finish hand tossed records because I had to work a full time job. Um, yeah. And same reason, like I didn't keep doing the Evansville vinyl project because I had to work a full time job and that was a nightmare to do. Uh, I left Wired because I had to work a full-time job. <laughs> it's just like everything, you know, you get to that point where it's just like, well, i I got to start adulting now. So, yeah. you know, I better just really try to understand where my time's got to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, actually, on you, you sent me some stuff a while back over Facebook Messenger. We were talking about maybe me trying to help out with Hand Talks Records yeah. at some point. Um, me and Andre have been talking a lot like a lot a lot recently we really want to get that back going up okay and we would love to like we don't want to be like the owners or you're the owner but we would love to (laughs) you know ownership (laughs) you know the owner of the idea of hand toss the idea of hand toss records sure you have uh you have rights to that idea but uh (laughs) no we'll uh we want to do it we want to we want to get more music out that's kind of why we're doing the whole podcast and everything and just all ties in together nicely yeah, no, Better. do it. Take it. You guys, Hell you yeah. have it. What about your comic? Uh, yeah, so that's really where almost all of my artistic energy has gone to. And I mean, I always, I always drew. I always did comics, sort of. I always liked reading comics. Um, 
And when I met my wife, the second she saw that I was drawing, she was basically she was basically like, uh, you should make comics. And I was like, I'm not good enough to make comics. And then she was like, no, look at some of these comics. And then there's there's some bad comics out there. I'm sure you could make comics like these. <laughs> and, and so she really pushed me to do it. Um, and then eventually um, it worked. You know, I got... Um, I got a, I kickstarted like a little 60 page graphic novel and then, um, I sort of pitched it to a publishing company and they were like, Hey, I like this, but it should be different. And I was like, okay. And then they agreed to put it out if I changed it. And then we like did more work and eventually we were able to put out like a full blown graphic memoir. Um, and so my book came out last year in October called Hardcore Anxiety, graphic, a graphic, I don't know, a graphic guide to punk rock and mental health and about my experience in punk and, uh, you know, everything that we've been talking about this whole time um, and dealing with mental health and then finding like a lot of my own mental health struggles and things like that. Uh, you know, I've been eventually been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, severe depression, anxiety, and ADHD. And so there's like all of that that I didn't know I had while playing in the music scene. And then it's like, oh, this all becomes very apparent at some point. Um, and then also looking back at the history of punk rock and mental health, you know, if you want to think like the first, what is considered to be the first hardcore record is literally called Nervous Breakdown. Yep. <laughs> it's like, so from the very beginning <laughs> of everything, we're unstable. Like, <laughs> exactly. That's just that's that's part of the culture, um, and so kind of analyzing that, um, that was a big part of the book, and and yeah, so that was like that took a lot of time to do, but that's really done well. The book's done pretty good. Um, I mean, it hasn't even been out for a year yet. Um, but Microcosm Publishing is the publishing company who put it out. They've put out a lot of, like, punk rock literature and, like, feminist literature. They make a lot of zines still. They, if you haven't, the best comic, like, what they're most probably best known for, there's a book called Unfuck Your Brain. It's by a doctor, Dr. Faith, um, which I don't know if that's like a, her real name or if it's a punk rock stage name because Dr. Faith sounds way too cool. Right. Um, but there's a book by her. And then they also put out the Henry and Glenn comic. Oh. Which is a comic of if, if Henry Rollins and Glenn Danzig were in a relationship together. Um, and so they put out that. And that's really how I got to know them. Um, but they put out my book. And I've got, they actually just announced, I don't know if you knew, they just announced my second book is coming out in October. What? Is, yeah, which is a graphic biography of Gigi Allen. No shit. Reed, yeah. you're like an unstoppable force, dude. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how this one, I mean, like, I finished it. I'm excited about it. It's going to be either, it's going to make me have a career or it's going to destroy <laughs> my career because... It's a it's a biography of a very, very terrible person that also was very fascinating. So, I actually used to work with a guy named Keith who he worked with some guy one of the guys in Blood Tribe, mm -hmm. um, but uh, he's actually good friends with Gigi Allen's actual family. Oh and, yeah, with like Earl uh, and and yeah then. yeah, and I was just talking to him at work one day about like. He's a musician as well. He plays in a local band called uh, Dragomite, I believe they're called. Okay. They, they're they're not very young, so they don't usually mingle with our our kind very much. But he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. Um. Anyway, he's always I, we were just talking about bands we knew, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I know the Murder Junkies and them boys real well." And I was like, "The hell do you mean?" He's just gonna casually say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just casually bring that up. <laughs> He said something about knowing Phil on Salmo and shit like that too. Like he knows yeah. like all that we like yeah. the. Uh, like southern rock punk like uh it punk rock nba just did a video on chad bands uh, it, yeah. all the chad bands <laughs> yeah but uh Man, that's crazy yeah i that's like the number one thing that i've learned and like i basically researched it for about a year and then wrote the book and then drew the book and i mean there's so much out there i mean Gigi allen's wild and crazy um 
I had contact. I, I basically I reached out to Merle and I talked to him, but he he shut me down. He didn't want to talk to me like on record about stuff because I guess he's making his own book, which is fine and respectful. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that's <laughs> that's the book that I just finished and is coming out in October um, this year, and then and then yeah, I'm working on other books. That's basically. I mean, I work my full-time job, and then I work uh, at City Church, and then I spend hours drawing books and just keep doing it and just keep trying to – that's that's where my all my artistic mind goes to. I don't really – I don't play music as much anymore. I quit playing shows for my own mental health because that's absolutely what I needed to do, and, and, uh, and it's just – I enjoy making comics. Making comics is kind of therapeutic in a way that music used to be. Um, but music, I would always want to rush. Like everyone always said, all the bands I was in, it's like I had a name for an album before the one we, like before we finished the previous one. <laughs> like, yeah. I had named Uglies before Child Songs was out. Like, I had already planned that record. And Endangered was planned before you know, anything started. And it's like, I was just always one step ahead. I just wanted to be like, I wanted to make the thing and then be done with the thing. Um, and in music, you can kind of do that, but in comics, you can't. And it really makes me enjoy the making of it a lot more. Well, that's awesome. Where, where can anybody go to purchase your books, your comics? Oh yeah, you can go. Um, so Microcosm Publishing is who uh, published both both my books, uh, both the G.G. Allen book and then the Hardcore Anxiety. And they're both available there. Um, G.G. Allen book is up for... G.G. Allen book is, is called Rock and Roll Terrorist, um, <laughs> which is what's written on his... Which, what was written on his tombstone, how he referred to himself. Um, and he... So that book should... It will be out in October. It's available for pre-order. Um... They're both, those are both on there. But then also I have a, um, a store envy that's just like readchancellor.storeenvy.com. Um, that's got some of my books, some art, um, some like smaller books I've made, like just fun little mini comics. Those are on there. Um, so you can, and that that's at my store envy, all on my Instagram and Twitter and all that junk. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm going to check it out, and then um, later you should send me some Facebook messages with links to all that. And I'll okay, add yeah, it to sure. The, post it all over the place. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, I, was, I was just going to still ask the question just in case, you know, I may be getting the wrong impression. Do you – what would you do? Would you ever play a um, – like a semi-annual show with not even an old band that you're already in, but if – like a new band? Would we ever see Reed playing a show once or twice a year? <laughs> Probably not. Um, yeah. And, and that's, like, I always joke about it. Um, every once in a while, like, Logan will send me being like, man, we should see if we can open this show. And I'm like, and, or I'll, it'll just, like, pop through my mind. I'm like, man, that'd be fun. And then I start to think about, like, all of the things that would have to go into playing a show again and like pre preparing to play a show and like for my own mental health like when I would play a show like I would become obsessive and it was really mm -hmm. bad uh like yes. to put it in perspective I remember every album release show I would like draw out the stage setup and like put little x's and like this is where I will stand this is where my pedal board will be and like was that methodical with it and of course it's like that doesn't matter we're gonna we're i'm gonna do all that planning and then i'm gonna show up and like the mic's not gonna work <laughs> and I'm about where where i'm gonna stand on stage two weeks before the show and i should be worrying about like do i know how to play this song or do i have my lyrics memorized because i often didn't or am i just gonna make them up on the spot like i i would just get over obsessive and so I stopped doing it. Um, the last show I played was probably in 2016, I think. And that was with uh, Quinn, because I played in Quinn for a year. Played drums in Quinn with Gary and, and all those guys. Um, and that was it. I was just like, 
I'm a lot happier now. I can look back and like really love that. I'm so happy I had, I have like history and like my upbringing in punk and in our local scene. Um, and I can look back at it and be happy about that. But as far as like playing again, I don't think I'd be able to not immediately go back to that obsessive like mindset. Um, so I won't ever say, I won't never say never, but probably not. <laughs> I don't think that I don't think you'll see me playing another show um, for a long time. Unless I will say this. I almost did it last year. Um, oh. Just the time didn't work out. It was going to be, it was different. It wasn't like a show show. It was going to be, um, at uh, River City, uh, Mercantile, uh -huh. downtown, Heather and Clint's spot. Uh, we were going to do, like, a book release show for Hardcore Anxiety. So, like, I was going to bring my books. Uh, we were going to – I was going to sell them, like, have a table. It was going to kind of be like a book signing event, um, sort of, but I was going to play, play some songs acoustically – and then talk about the book and then play songs like interspersed. It was going to be like a, an author talk with some music. Um, so that was going to, that would probably be the closest thing that I would do to a show. Um, I thought I might do one again. I might try to do one this year instead, but with all the COVID stuff, there's a good chance that I'm not going to try to <laughs> try to take on anything else, but um, eventually maybe I'll, I'll work something out like that. Um, that would probably be the closest thing that I'd ever that you'd ever see to playing a show, um, because I wouldn't think of it as a show as much as I'd think of it as I'm going to play three songs and then try to talk you into buying my book. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you got to take care of your mental health, man. I've had uh, my yeah. struggles as well. Like mm -hmm. everybody's had struggles out definitely, um, and we don't. I don't think that people in the music scene. I don't know. You have the people in the music scene that either talk about them not enough at all or way too much yep. and it's really hard to find an in-between and you're scared to fall into one of those categories usually absolutely yeah i mean that's why i ignored it like yeah for years and i mean like that that's what's in my book is my you know ignorance of it for for 10 plus years of just like um uh, man i'm really starting to hate this and i'm really starting to hate who i am and have all these problems and what should i do about it well instead of reaching out and getting help or like talking to someone about it. It's like, I'll just join three other bands <laughs> and like mm -hmm. that, that doesn't solve anything. Um, and I did that for way too long. Um, and eventually, you know, you get through this, you, you, you get to that point where, you know, you need to talk about it. It needs to be talked about. The stigma needs to be removed to where you don't fall in those two categories. And that's the hard part. Cause, cause it is, you know, either you're the person who talks about it, like, constantly and you're just like i have depression i have depression i have et cetera, or whatever you have or whatever you deal with and then there's people who are like i'm not going to talk about it at all because i'm scared of being judged for it uh -huh. and the best thing to do is just don't judge it there should be no judgment on it. what exactly thing is just you know talk about it seek help don't be afraid to talk about it and that's overall that's like the whole point of my book like all that i ever hope that anybody gets out of my story because my story isn't i wouldn't say it's as drastic as a lot of other stories and sometimes i think that's kind of nice about it is that like there wasn't a an enormous like traumatic experience in my life that caused me to have you know any mental illness or like mental health issues but they still exist um mm -hmm. And a lot, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and say that that was important to them. That like, you know, when, if I said it's like, oh yeah, well I have depression. Sometimes people's first reaction is, well, what do you have to be depressed about? And it's like, that's, that's, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people don't know that. And so that's kind of what I was hoping to do with the book. Educate that. Also talk about so many of the punk rock people who have mental health struggles that don't, that you don't know, like. A lot of people don't know HR from the Bad Brains had schizophrenia, like, and then you know stuff like, I mean Billy Joe Armstrong has panic attacks. Iggy Pop had a huge depression um, while making his like last record after David Bowie died, and 
even Ray Davies of the Kinks, like, you know, tried to commit suicide and was bipolar. And like, you have, there's just so much history that's ingrained in like this idea of punk. And I think that it can kind of be a refuge for people with mental health issues. And it can also be like a fearful, never ending cycle of it. Um, and I don't think that's talked about enough. And so that's why, you know, I made a book. I talk about it. You should go buy it. Everyone should buy my book. It's great. I drew it. Buy I it. its book. Buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. I, I, I'm really glad that you are somebody who, you in particular are a person who um, should speak on matters like that because you just have an air about you that not really commands respect, but politely invites respect in. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm that, glad I think you said that, and this is on record so that everyone will know that, and my wife will be, she'll laugh at that. That'll be funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely. Um, I have one more, just one more question before I wrap up here. Um, is there any, like, artists of any kind, doesn't have to be music, it could be, um, you could talk about River City or whatever, is there anything going on in, like, the area that you think people should know about that aren't, isn't being talked about right now? Um, sure. I mean, the big thing, and I don't, I mean, it's not, there's two things, I guess. The one thing that I would say is local, uh, I guess two things really, because there's definitely support your local businesses, of course, right now more than ever with definitely. all of this, all the pandemic. I mean, as places are opening up, support them, you know, go to River City Mercantile to buy a cup of coffee. It's better than Starbucks. I don't even drink coffee, mm -hmm. but support them go there because uh, in you know in six months when if they have to close you're going to be like oh man i miss that place why aren't they exist anymore well because you went to starbucks too much you know I and swear to God. they weren't allowed to be open for so long um so support businesses i know i said i only said river city but all local businesses that's just the only one i can think of right now um <laughs> another local thing that i think is really cool um and it's a little bit selfish because I was involved in it. Um, uh, Ty and Emily Bernhardt, they put out an EP um, just like a couple weeks or maybe a month ago called, uh, oh man, I'm going to forget the name of the EP. The band is called Head of House. I can't remember the name of the EP, which is really bad, but I played on it. I uh, played guitar and bass on the EP and it's really great. You should go support that Head of House on Bandcamp. Um, I'm really, like, I've told them countlessly that it's some of the best music that I've heard come out of Evansville in a really long time. Um, and I was really proud to be a part of it. Um, we'll play it next week, then. Oh, yeah. There dude. we go. Shameless it's, it's, plugs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I guess not, lo not, lo not um, contained in only local artistically. Um, um just you know with all of this uh, i speaking from like the comic book community specifically um comics is kind of like an odd um business just the way that it's handled and like publishing is weird but then publishing comics is even weirder um and since all of like conventions have been shut down like so many artists are at risk of just like really really diving deep into poverty which is just really hard for them especially since most comic book artists are freelance workers so if you're into comics or if you were at one point and you just are looking for something i really advise get back into it look into your local shops look into local artists um i'm gonna plug my friend who actually is local uh kyle starks lives in evansville and he's a fantastic comic book writer and artist and has books everywhere that you could ever search for um but search for his books support support these people support them they they need it you know and if we want books you know that are out even not even just books like mine just books that entertain or educate you we got to support them especially in times like this where it's just super easy for businesses and for industries to suffer so that that would really be my only thing would just be I'm excited to see people create and support the creations. So many people are stuck at home right now. And if you've ever been like, well, if you ever sat at home and like thought, I wish I had the time to learn how to play guitar 
and you're in lockdown, well, now's your chance, <laughs> you know, <laughs> play guitar. Um, like, I read it over the over this pandemic because I got a book. Let's see, I think it's over there somewhere. But it was like book. It was the the best of punk magazine. So like the like the first magazine that came out about punk on newsprint, and like the back was a huge ad that was like pictures of guitar chords and it had three pictures. It said, "This is a chord. This is a chord. This is a chord." Now go start a band. And it's yeah, like, I've there's seen no that. there's no excuse to not do it. Um, and so that's something. That's something I would just encourage people because the art that can come out of this, like really, really shitty, scary, unpredictable time that we're stuck in, like the art that comes out of it could be amazing. Um, and I encourage everyone to do what they feel like they can and what they want to do, what they feel inspired to do, whether it's write a book, drawing a picture, take up painting, play it, learn a chord, learn a new hobby. I don't know. I just learned how to solder things, and I felt like such Hell a yeah. damn man. And it's just like, <laughs> that. like you know, you learn these things. Just just find something that you want to do, and that you feel confident that you can do to make your to get through this time. And and hopefully, if you choose to make something like artful and release it into the world, know that seeing other people make art does more than you think. Like, anytime somebody creates something and then somebody else is a part of it, like, immediately, you may not think that, you know, some weird, shitty punk band that you release a song online out of nowhere, um, like, is going to mean anything to anybody. I would never thought, like, at the beginning when you said that Scandalmongers were, like, considered a big thing, I would have never thought that. I still don't think that. I consider it's, like, you know, people remember us as this weird band that didn't make any sense because you had a really pretty looking drummer and you had a really weird bearded guy who looked like he was 40 and then you had me who was chubby and out of breath like you just that's like that's that's what we thought and you know you never know what what you put out there that's gonna affect people and I think that if you feel like you have something that you've never done that you want to do um now is the time. Now is the time to help people in anything, whether it's, you know, the other day I drew a comic of a bootleg comic of Popeye the Sailor Man beating up somebody. And I was like, <laughs> I'm going to put that out in the world someday. <laughs> Even I don't think it's going to change anybody's life, but it may entertain them for 10 minutes. And if it does that, then it does something. It's then a you part of goal. That. Exactly. That's all. Just I think that support what's being made. If you're able to or you want to make something yourself because you never know what it can mean to somebody else. Well, thank you so much, Reed, for being on the show. You have been great. I always love talking to you and I miss you so much. But we need to get together sometime. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And thank you again, Reed. Everybody, this has been Reed from pretty much everything in Evansville. <laughs> <laughs> but it Thank was nice talking to you, man. Me. Yeah, it's really good talking to you, Johnny. Much love. Talk to you later. <laughs>